to give you praise and honor and we thank you for this time that we can come together and we can think about your word and we can think about what it means to us and we can learn how to read it and to study it and how it can make a difference in our lives so we do pray that you'll be with all of us tonight and guide us in all that we do and we pray all these things asking this prayer in the name of the lord jesus christ amen all right i'll hand it over to luke thank you very much thanks pete good evening everybody hoping everyone is excited and interested in our topic for tonight if you're not i'm going to make you excited and interested um special thanks for the plates of savory and uh, sweet nibbles I also have more sweet nibbles, but you only get them if you actively participate. And as I said to Aunty Jackie before, you don't heckle me. So you need to participate actively, but also participate nicely. All right, um, we've got lots of things to hand out as well, um, because your active participation um, will also include things for you to do. Because what I want to be able to help you all to understand is Bible studying and Bible marking and understanding what's in the Bible is perhaps not as big and scary a thing as you might think. I can remember being in primary school through to high school and hearing about all of those ideas and things that you could do or should do and really being a bit scared and fearful because what if I got it wrong? So I want to dispel a myth straight away. And that is, when you study the Bible, you're not going to break it. You will not break the Bible by studying. You will actually get a better understanding of what God has put down, and that will be really helpful for you. So how is it that, um, for example, I would go about studying? There's many questions about studying the Bible, and my aim is to answer as many of these as possible. Hi, Ollie. (laughs) Oh, sorry, was that supposed to be quiet? Yep, maybe next time. So lots of different questions. Who, how, where, what with, when, what? Now, as you're looking at those questions, there's one important one that's missing. Who's the first person to tell me what's missing? Good. First part, well done. Why? So it's really important to understand the reasons for studying the Bible before looking at the answers to those other questions and to understand what is it that the Bible can do for us. Now, I want to look at some verses that help us in understanding that. So let's firstly open our Bibles up, please. And let's go to Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. Now, as you're turning to Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 4, early on in the chapter, Paul describes how the gospel or the good news was preached. And some of you who were here for Uncle Andrew's talk last week would have heard about what the gospel is, what it means, and lots of details there. It it also describes the belief that came from understanding that gospel through the rest of that chapter as well. It also describes those who didn't necessarily believe and um, Paul describes them as those who uh, who have an unbelief. But in verse 12, we have uh, an interesting illustration. Hebrews 4 verse 12 says, For the word of God is quick, that means alive, and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So we have this word of God being like a sword. Now I've got enough props. I was going to get a sword, but um, I'm just going to leave that for the moment. You can all imagine what that is. Uh, And maybe just start thinking about different swords. Because if we come across to our next 
verse in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians, at the end of Ephesians, we've got this interesting word picture of a spiritual warrior. Someone who is a warrior, a fighter for God. And starting at verse 13 of Ephesians chapter 6, we read, Take unto you the whole armour of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and praying always with prayer. So we've got these different elements of this spiritual warrior. But again, we have this word of God being like a sword. So what is it that I want you to do? I want you to draw a sword. And here's where we start all getting a little bit active. So draw a sword. Now, what I also need from you, please, three important things for your sword. It must have a blade, it must have a hilt, it must have a handle. A hilt. When you're holding a sword, you have a handle and then you have a piece that goes across. That is the hilt. It's the thing that protects your hand. No worries. I will give you maybe one minute to draw a sword. And then I will see how good your swords are. Oh, you're sharing. Maybe another 30 seconds. You could have time later if you really want to make your sword picture absolutely exceptional. Okay, 10 more seconds. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Pens down, that's enough shading and prettiness. Now, I would like you all to please hold up the swords that you have drawn. So that I can see them, please, because I'm, I'm trying to work at it. Yeah. Ethan's gone straight for an asterisk type sword. It's Goliath's sword. Is it? <laughs> Looks like a letter opener. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Okay, I think we've all earned the lollies for the tables. Well done.
All right. Great job on those swords. Now, we're going to come back to that in just a minute, but there's one last quote that I want us to please look up. That quote is in Timothy. Please come with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Because I'm sure a lot of you, most of you, have known about the Bible since a young age and you've probably also got younger siblings who know about the Bible as well. So 2 Timothy 3, starting at verse 15... Paul describes how that from a child you've known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof or testing, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. So when we bring all of those three verses together, we have something that's powerful, something that's sharp. It's got various elements to it. And there are different things that we can gain from the Bible. But in order to gain those things, we need to understand them. And in order to understand them, then we need to research, study, learn and appreciate them. So that sword picture that you drew, here's one that I drew. See, there's a real pencil there too. And you've got your sword drawn there too. And uh, you'll see why I've asked you to draw these different parts. Because firstly, you've got that blade that goes up and down. Right? You've got that hilt. Now, Ethan's sword and many swords I saw just had a cross piece as the hilt. If you've seen a fencing foil, or perhaps one of those fancy pants swords in an old movie, it's like this half spherical shape that encompasses the whole hand. Yeah. And then you've got the handle down the bottom. So that's pointing downwards. So when you think about the Bible as this sword, all of these things are relevant because you've got this blade that helps us understand something higher up, which is God. Both his character his plan, his purpose, the things he's written down for us to understand, what he's done with his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So we can understand more about God and his ways. Secondly, from the Bible, we can understand people better. Men, women, boys and girls. And we can gain a better understanding from scripture about mankind, about humanity. We can find out about so many different people in the Bible. We can read about what happened to them. We can study what they said. We even get insight into their thoughts, into their feelings, things that we can hear and relate to. We see and, and read about their motives, their successes and their failures. And all of this can help us learn about humanity and what God has done for all of us through his son. And finally... The handle. Who wants to take a guess what the handle is? Me. And the reason that I'm saying that's me is when we hold the sword, generally it's sticking out, isn't it? And you've got a bit that's pointing right back at me. So from the Bible we get this insight into God's ways, into humankind, and then also into ourselves. Something that is real and personal. It describes things we can trust in and look forward to in the future. And if there's nothing else you take away from tonight, other than a full stomach of food and maybe some cavities starting to form, it's this picture. God's word is a sword. It helps me understand him and mankind and me. All right. How is this good for us? I'm just going to turn up these couple of verses and read them out for you. John chapter 15, firstly. And these are things that Jesus shared. John chapter 15, verse 13. 
Jesus said, greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. He goes on to say, you're my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. So if we want to appreciate those godly ways and perhaps be a bit different to mankind and understand that connection to God, then we need to understand those commandments and be closer to Jesus and his Father. And then also in chapter 13... Jesus says, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. So the first verse, he describes those who know his commands and follow them as his friends. And then here, he describes those who know him and love each other as his disciples. I want you all to take 30 seconds to write down what does disciple mean. Use your own words. Just take half a minute to a minute. Just write down a disciple is and then extend that definition. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Is anyone courageous enough to share their definition of a disciple with me? Just with me, I won't tell anyone else. Yes. Yeah, you can tell me out loud. I, I won't tell anyone else. Um, disciple, you're a follower. A follower? Good, well done. Yeah. Anyone else got any other descriptions? Yes, Joy. Yeah, like students. students. Ooh, interesting. You've been looking at my notes? Yeah. Right, so Joy's cheated. No, he hasn't cheated. But he's come up with an interesting description of a, a student. The word disciple. A lot of English words are stolen. They're stolen from other languages, and disciple's one of them. It comes from the Latin language, Completely dead now, but in the Latin, the word discipuli meant students. If you wanted to find discipuli, you would find them in a Roman school. Girls, I'm sorry, if you try and find female discipuli, they're not there. Girls weren't allowed to go to school. Girls weren't allowed to teach. Girls weren't allowed to do a lot of things. So only the boys could be discipuli. Now, when the students would walk in, when you walk into the classroom, I'm sure you have that happy salutation, good morning, students, good morning, miss, mister, whatever it is. Well, back in those Roman days, the teacher, Magister, would walk in and he would say, salvete discipuli, which means, hello, students. So when you see disciples, Think of those who study, learn and understand. Even if you really don't like studying, learning or understanding. So, we can see how there's a little bit of relevance though for the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he was esteemed as a master and a rabbi and a teacher, can't we? So, they are the disciples. Alright, we had a couple of other questions to quickly go through as well. Who should be studying the Bible. Who should gain an appreciation of these things? Well, it is everybody. And you know what's a good idea? Starting young, as with those people at the tables. Everyone who's at the tables, all young. Now, whereabouts should we study the Bible? Well, actually, it's anywhere. But I'll, I'll qualify a little bit, anywhere that's practical. Because, for example, if you had some important homework or important assignment to get done and you try to do it in the middle of the living room when someone's vacuuming, when someone's playing, when someone's doing something else, you cannot focus or concentrate. You get angry and storm out. 
So you need to find somewhere that is convenient. Find somewhere that's practical. One of the best studying experiences I had wasn't even inside. It was outside. It was at a School of the Prophets weekend, which was lots of um, young brethren and young men um, coming together at the Hebron campsite in Adelaide. And I managed to get a desk outside and that's where I was studying through the afternoons. And it was awesome because I could feel being part of nature and the environment. So, anywhere that is practical. And, and what about when? Well, that's going to be different to everyone, but any time is a time to study and understand God's word. Because it doesn't matter if you're a morning sparrow or a night owl or perhaps an exhausted pigeon who's somewhere in between and doesn't really know when to do what. <laughs> Funny, I saw a lot of mothers going, <laughs> you're a weary pigeon. Yeah, that's me. So these are the easiest questions to answer in terms of Bible study. But when we come to how do we do it, what do we, what do we use and what do we do it with, that takes a little bit more attention. So I want to firstly go through some key elements to how to go about Bible study. Firstly, it has to start with a decision to do it. You need to consciously apply yourself to studying God's word. You need to choose to do it because it's important, because it's interesting, because it's something you find pleasure in doing. And having made that decision, as with a lot of things as well in life, start with prayer and ask for God's help in what you're about to do. Now, studying the Bible has a difference in terms of outcome, but the actual process is not that different to other types of studying and learning, in that you need to ask, you need to investigate. You don't reach a point where you say, cool, I'm absolutely done, I've finished and I can move on. There is so much to learn about the Bible. Some of the best examples of discipline students, disciples that I've seen are those who've notched up several decades of life. Not more than four decades like me, I mean like more than seven or eight decades. Who will consistently be at nights like this. They are still wanting to be with us and wanting to learn because it's such a valuable thing and that inspires and energises me. Fourthly, remember that sword. So as you're reading the Bible, as you're studying it, just think about that sword and the different parts that that helps us to see where the Bible talks about God or his son or his ways or what's happening with mankind and, and others or what's happening with you and what you might deal with day by day. And the final thing I'll point out from my direct experience, is you might feel when you first start studying the Bible that you're crawling along. Or worse, it feels like you're swimming through toffee. Yeah, I just can't get further, I'm stuck. You might feel unsure of whether you're doing it right or that you might be missing something or that someone else needs to help you along. But as I said at the start, you're not going to break the Bible. Another secret is that you won't recall everything you hear. And that's why the most important thing for Bible study for me is this. It is a pencil. It is a very simple thing. But what it means is when I'm looking at something in the Bible and someone makes a relevant point, I can note it down. Do not assume you have such supreme mental prowess that you will soak in everything. Use something to take those notes and to mark those things in your Bible as well. Now, in order to do that, I think one of the really important things in how to go about Bible study and what do I do it with is to use a physical Bible. It is certainly becoming... Uh, more um, 
frequent now to use digital sources instead. But there's reasons why using a physical Bible is really helpful, particularly when it comes to the reading, the noting, the marking and the studying. So then start by reading. Just start by reading. I learnt as a teenager at a Bible school that good Bible study starts with good Bible reading. And the brother who led the session then illustrated that further by doing some bad reading. Just to show if you don't read well, it makes it really hard to understand. It also helps to use a version that is um, a good balance in what is literally expressed and its readability as well. And we're going to have a look at that in just a minute. The other thing that I think is important is having some relevant stationery. So I've pointed out the pencil. The other thing that sits comfortably in my Bible is a multi-coloured pencil. If you don't have that, there's other options. Ye olde highlighter pencils. Straight from the 80s, Luke Lawson giving it a big nod. <laughs> other things that are really good to use for noting in your Bible are these Bible marking pens. I am not plugging what is contained in the library, but do go and obtain your materials from the library. Um, there is a shortage on certain colours. Uh, there might have been a rush on the, uh, the green and the red. I think there's plenty of black, as I saw. So, um, Absolutely. Um, and there's more colours than that now, too. Um, and the, the last thing is a ruler. Because it's really helpful when you're marking things up and you're trying to like, line up a comment to something to actually rule a little line there. Now, I want to show you, because sometimes it can feel a little bit um, odd, um, yeah, you're describing these things, Uncle Luke, but really, what does, it, what does it look like? So, I have a little camera and I'm going to show you some of my high-quality Bible marking efforts. Yes, camera sideways at the moment. It will correct itself shortly. All right. Are you ready? Because it's really exciting. Okay, Uncle Luke's Bible insights. So, in here, this is 2 Timothy 3. This is the last few verses that we were reading out. And you can see there, firstly, I've got this little blue shading down the side. It also matches the colour on this insert on the side. So I've developed this little code so that if there's blue pencil there, I know it's talking about the Bible. You can also see off to the side, I've made a few notes, you can see little green there and green in the actual verse. So what I've also done is develop this little um, code of black is for comments, green is for numbers, red is for verses. Just a nice easy way for everything to be all the same. Now, what's this other piece of paper here? Well, what I've done, because there's not a lot of room next to 2 Timothy, I've taken some inspiration from notes to describe and write down all these items relating to the inspiration of the Bible. So that is there and will always be there for me to look at and refer to. If I go back a couple of pages, similarly, at the end of Peter is the key verse for me about God. And then I've got an insert here, all about God. So, that's what it looks like. Hopefully that's a little bit helpful so you can see something real as opposed to someone just saying, this is what it could be like. So I mentioned the, the way of using them. And then the next thing is using tools to help you. Because reading, yes, you can, you can see the words there and you can make sense of them, but then understanding them to a next level might need a bit more than your own brain power. 
Now, I mentioned before about what version to use. Now, there's lots of different versions. This chart gives you a little bit of an appreciation of those different versions and where they might be helpful or useful. So, up the darker end, you've got something that's really close to the original language, the Hebrew and the Greek that was um, originally written in. All the way through to the other side, which is more about its readability than it is what was originally recorded. So, you've got this whole spectrum of different versions that you could use. One that's reasonably popular within our community has been for a long time the King James Version, which is up this uh, form equivalent end. It can be a little bit difficult to read though because the language is from when. Does anyone want to take a guess how many years ago was the King James Version written? Sorry? 1611. Okay, let's go bang on to the date then. Good work. <laughs> so in 1604, King James I of England said, let's get a new Bible, please. So off they went. It was completed by nearly 50 scholars from the Church of England, so it's now about 400 years old. Now, as a point of comparison, William Shakespeare was writing at the same time. If you've picked up a work of Shakespeare and tried to make sense of it from start to finish, well done because you normally need some kind of interpretation, notes, dictionary, etc. Now, one that isn't shown on this particular picture that, that I do want to mention to you is the Interlinear Bible, which is way on the left-hand side. That's basically a layout of the Hebrew and the Greek and then just a, an absolute translation of each word as it's laid out in Hebrew and Greek. You can't really make sense of it at all because you'd get none of the style that is required in the English language versus Greek or Hebrew. Um, as an illustration of that uh, original language um, in the original King James Version, you can probably make sense of it, but you can see some of the rules around spelling and grammar weren't necessarily there. You've got a few letters that might get chucked around a little bit, but by and large, it's pretty much the same as it was in the 1600s. Okay, tools. Let's get on to some tools, please. The primary tool that I find helpful, and a lot of people find helpful, is a concordance. It was originally printed as a really, really, really large book. You see how big your Bible is? A concordance from start to finish is even bigger because it's actually repeating a lot of um, verses and content. It's really an alphabetical index of all the words in the Bible and uh, a dictionary that provides a fuller meaning of each word and related words as well. In terms of how big it actually is, you've got around 14,300 words in there. That's how deep it goes. To understand what was actually expressed originally in the Bible. It was put together by a Mr Strong, not the one who inspired Mr Men. He was focused more on uh, divinity and theology. Um, he was actually a part of the, um, the efforts to produce the American Standard Version because he was uncomfortable with some of the wording, some of the translation in the King James Version and contributed to that next translation um, being generated. Now, at the back end of Strong's, you get all of the definitions. Um, and Mr Strong used the lexicons of Jesenius, Thayer, and also Thirst, although Thirst is listed last here. So, he was using a lot of the information and research that had been done by contemporaries rather than um, investigating that a lot himself. Okay. The other set of tools that I want to describe to you are study guides and commentaries. And I've got some examples up the front just to help illustrate. Firstly, it was reasonably common as a prize-giving award 
to receive one of these, Story of the Bible. It's an eight book series and provides a a little more explanation in terms of what happened um, in the Bible, um, written by Christadelphian several decades ago, um, Perse Mansfield. And it's really helpful to sometimes get a clearer idea of what's actually being described. Only Jules and I actually took one off the shelf last night because we were a bit stumped when we were reading something, uh, doing the readings. So let's go to story of the Bible, let's see what's expressed. So there's a couple of examples there. Uh, One other that he also wrote, which is I've found really cool to refer to, this one which is the guidebook to the Gospels. And the reason that I find it really helpful, I'll just come and show it to you a bit closer um, in a minute, but it actually lays out the events down the side and then the Gospels themselves. So if you haven't seen, you can see each of the Gospels as columns and you can see the chapters and the verses and then all the events that have actually taken place. Because sometimes you find that there's things that are repeated or cross over in the Gospels and it's good to see how other things actually interleave with those. So they're things that I find particularly helpful. So these study guides and commentaries help us because they can explain context, they can clarify links and cross-references and highlight some important themes. And a lot of them have actually been digitised as well, um, which is quite helpful. Um, I have included a link, but then I've realised that I haven't set up my new computer to get internet and I can't click on it and then show you anything. So that's going to be a little bit of an impediment. One of the reasons that those references are important is this picture. It's not just a rainbow. What it illustrates is these white bars along the bottom are the 66 books of the Bible. Each of these lines is a reference from one book to another. Just soak in how many lines are on that. Over 64,000 cross-references. That's how wisely written by God this book is. Even though it was written by about 40 different people who were inspired by God to put these things down. Over hundreds and hundreds of years. Yet you've still got this consistency throughout. So it's awesome to to see and understand and appreciate that. Um, I was going to take you um, to a look at um, a website that shows you some of the um, guides and commentary, but um, we'll leave that to get on to our practical activity. We've all been excited about it. So on your page, flip it over, please. I also want you to turn to Genesis 5. Have Genesis 5 open next to you. So then you can see both. Now, what we're going to look at is Noah and his forefathers. Um, And I've included that worksheet um, if you wanted to scratch something out first. Particularly, if you haven't done a lot of Bible marking first, I wish that someone had given me a practice. Because the first time I did Bible marking, my writing's not really good as it is. Um, I then tried to fix it with liquid paper. It was just ugly. So if you're not 100% confident, then, then use that sheet. And we're going to piece together the timeline from Methuselah to his great-grandsons and see how that family fits together in a very key event. So, firstly, what you will do is look at verse 21, where it says, Enoch lived 65 years and begat Methuselah. So you've got Methuselah being born at year zero. Now, at at the bottom of your page, where you've got a bit of space... I want you to just 
put a dot on the left hand side. So I put a dot on the left. So I've got Methuselah being, bo being born. And just above that dot, put something like M year zero. Okay, next. In verse 25, we have Lamech being born. And it describes there, Methuselah lived 187 years and begat Lamech. Who has a ruler with them? A couple of people, not too many, that's all right. Here's where we can sort of use our fantastic imagination or our accuracy in drawing stuff. Because we're going to use a renowned biblical drawing principle, which is a millimetre for a decade principle. So we've got 187 years, and we're just going to draw a line that is 18.7 millimetres. It's about two centimetres, okay? So, look, as thick as my thumb, that's about two centimetres. So you just draw that little line across, put another little dot, and that is up the top, M year 187. And just underneath, you can just write Lamech is born. All good so far? All right. Verses 28 and 29, it says, Lamech lived 182 years, begat a son, and called his name Noah. So... We've then got about another thumb width forward to go, to go ahead another 182 years. So rule again. And then we've got M year 369. Because Methuselah was 187 when Lamech was born and we've hit this 182 year mark. Now this also gives us an opportunity to create a second line. So straight under that dot, maybe, maybe give it a few centimetres gap, we can put in another dot, and that is N for Noah, year zero. So, it will look something like this, okay? Forgive the writing, please. Okay, three dots in a line and then one dot below. Okay, next, verses 30 and 31. Lamech lived after he begat Noah 595 years and begat sons and daughters. All the days of Lamech were 777 years and he died. So somehow we need to go from Lamech's first year, 777 years on. Now, I would make that roughly the width of my forefingers from when Lamech is born. So then we've got another dot, and that is M year 964. And then underneath that same time for Noah is when he is 595 years old. Now, the next chapter, chapter 6, verse 3, describes the warning that Yahweh gave to Noah about the flood. 
It says, Yahweh said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. So the warning in chapter 6, verse 3, was 120 years before the flood. And then we know from chapter 7, verse 6, Noah was 600 when the flood of waters was upon the earth. So the flood warning is given when Noah is 480. So on that line down the bottom, maybe three finger width for Noah, when he was 480, is that warning. Okay, Noah's sons are then born in verse 32. Noah was 500 um, when he has those children. So slightly after that warning, when he's 500, is when his sons are born. And then we need to go over to our next piece of information which is back in verse 27, all the days of Methuselah were 969 years and he died. Now, when you bring that little line for Methuselah across at his year 969, that matches up with when Noah was 600. What happened when Noah was 600? Not quite. The flood came. So we've got Methuselah and the flood happening right at the same time. That's quite extraordinary. Now, it's even more extraordinary when we dig a little bit further. So chapter 7 and verse 6, we already looked at that, is when Noah was 600 and the flood came. Now, in looking at Methuselah's name... It's actually made up of a couple of pieces. So this is straight out of Strong's Concordance. What does Methuselah's name mean? Well, firstly, Mr Strong and Hebrew scholars will say, you're saying it wrong, stop saying it like an Aussie. His name is actually Methuselah. The KH being like the CH in Bach or the GH in Van Gogh. Please don't say Van Gogh, he cut off his other ear. You've got to get it in your throat, then go. There's a lot of that around wintertime. That's why we need masks and shields and stuff. So, that is his name originally. Now, those two pieces, we've got um, Meth at the start and then Shelach afterwards. Now, one of the interesting things in Hebrew, does anyone know anything about the vowels in Hebrew? How easy is it to work out the vowels in Hebrew? It's not easy at all. There's lots of consonants, not too much in the vowels. The vowels are like little dots and things. They're called jots and tittles. They're like little markings. And it's quite easy for them not to be quite right. So if it's muth instead of meth, then it means die or death. And then shelach comes, is closely associated with a similar word, shalach, which means to send or to project. Now, if we combine that together, Methuselah's name means his death will send something. Put yourself in Noah's family and you've got this 950, 960-year-old very, very, very great, great, great grandfather there. And you know there's rain coming. Now, if it wasn't for some good Bible study to see how all of these things fit together, you would never, ever appreciate that. How Methuselah lived for nearly a thousand years and had a name that was saying something really important but it only became really clear when he was in his 8th century of age. 
that something was coming when his grandson Noah had a warning about a flood. That's one of the little illustrations, little exercises I went through as a teenager and to show you what that looks like, if I can actually get to the right thing. Here is how I have it represented in my Bible, down the bottom of the page. So we have Methuselah being born, Lamech being born, Noah, all the way through to, when we get to this point of the flood, I've got question mark years between Methuselah's death and the flood because of the importance of his name and that event for mankind. That's something that I can remember as a notable exercise. I can remember sitting like you guys going through this and just going, wow, how cool is the Bible? And that's the kind of energy and motivation you can get when you spend the time to understand God's word. So what is it that we can do now? Just a few thoughts to take away in terms of Bible study, um, as well as the things that we can use. Maybe one, one other thing just to, just to reference as well. There are some other more interesting things that can help you be inspired about the Bible. This was absolutely Liam's, my favourite, the Brick Bible, containing interesting graphical representations of Bible events and um, individuals um, in Lego and was something that was a bit of a brawl between Liam and myself as to who was going to get it. When Eva has used this for Sunday school, it is invariably stolen by one of the teenage boys because they find it so interesting. So there are some really... Uh, interesting things that can um, help us to understand the Bible. But the age that you guys are at, maybe you're a little bit past those graphical things. So there's a couple of things that I'd like to share with you that were helpful for me in my learning about the Bible. Firstly, it was preparing for baptism. A little book that was collated by an ecclesia in Adelaide, 15 lessons that help you understand things about the Bible, Garden of Eden, etc. And coupled with that is this Bible marking course. So those verses that I'd marked up, those inserts that I'd done, are based on the information contained here. I actually found a couple of mistakes in this as well. Some of the verses were a bit wrong. So always make sure you check your sources. Really good things to help. But perhaps the right thing to do is getting into that good headspace, particularly when you're looking at why you want to study the Bible. It needs to be something that is motivated by good, something that will help you build up in a positive way, not mere academic knowledge so that you can show how smart you are, how many verses you know. It's got to be more about the application than the... Um, than the actual content. Understand what it means and apply it. So what could I study or what should I study? A few little snippets to perhaps get your, your minds thinking. Think about a favourite character, Ruth, Joseph, someone whose life story is really interesting to you. There might also be a book that really interests you. Jonah, again, that's, that's a, a, a key Bible character, but also a book on its own. Um, Malachi or James. And I've, I've mentioned these because they're not really long. I haven't put up, let's go for Isaiah or Jeremiah, something that's really <laughs> short. No. They can take a, a, a little more effort. And that is indeed why when Paul was preaching the word and there was discussion about milk versus meat. What is it that you can digest? There might be some things that are a bit harder to digest. So bite off what you can actually chew. Maybe look at a particular section, something like Jesus' Sermon on the Mount or the first journey of Paul. Just have a look at what happened, where he went, where are those actual places? Would they be interesting to visit? 
or perhaps a theme, something like prayer or love, or perhaps looking at those fundamental or first principles, understanding more about God and what he's written in the Bible and the important promises that he made and that give us hope. Because there's some helpful exhortation from others who were studying centuries ago. In the Acts, it describes how the brothers sent Paul and Silas off to Berea at once during the night. When they arrived, they went to the Jewish synagogue. These Jews were more open-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they eagerly received the message, examining the scriptures carefully every day to see if these things were so. The two interesting things there, they were in their Bibles every day, making sure what they heard properly fitted in with what God had said. And also, it was they. It wasn't a solitary thing. They all did this, and maybe they all did it together. And how much better is it to share really cool, exciting, interesting things that you've learned or done with your friends? So hopefully that's been a a little insight into some of the things that might help you to study. I'd also encourage you to talk to your parents, grandparents, aunties, uncles about things that they might have studied, things that they found interesting because it might help you as well. Thanks everyone for your attention and I hope you've enjoyed the lollies through the night too. Well, on behalf of everybody, thank you very much, Luke. Um, We've got some good tools now to go take away with us. Um, I've neglected to bring my my plan up to see what's on next week. Thank you very much, sir. So next Wednesday evening will be the 10th of August. In the chair is Brother Steve Mansfield and Brother John Boardman is down to give a talk on Is Faith Only for Fools? So that will be interesting. Um, Same time, same place. All right, if everyone would like to remain seated, we'll uh, just close tonight with a prayer. Our loving Father in heaven, We come to give you praise, to give you honour and to give you glory. We recognise you are the creator of all things. And tonight we have considered that you are the creator of this wonderful word that we have. We thank you that you have made it possible that this book has been compiled so carefully throughout the years. And we thank you that... You've given it to us that we may use it in our own lives. Help us to remember that it can be a sword that can pierce inside us and help us to understand who we are, help us to understand others, and most of all, help us to understand who you are, our wonderful creator. So we pray that you will please be with us as we leave this place, guide us all in the different places we are travelling And we do ask that if it be your will, you'll bring us back again here to meet together again safely. But our dear God, we pray most of all that you will send your kingdom soon. Please send your son so that this world can be healed from all of the sickness and the suffering. So we put all things into your care. We thank you for blessing us with so many good things. And we thank you now for the supper that we can share together. And so we praise your great name and we offer this prayer in and through your dear son, the Lord Jesus the Christ. Amen.